Party of Order is a bunch of cucks. I, 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 I got, okay, baby. <laughs> <laughs> They're rhinos. Yeah. <laughs> it, they, it were, is, they literally were rhinos, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, they were like monarchists who were masquerading as Republicans. And you should not cry for the monarchy as long live the Republic. Hello, and welcome to the 23rd episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday the 4th of March 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we wrap up Chapter 6, The Victory of Bonaparte. I have the new patron Jordan Friedland to thank. Jordan has been helping me out with the editing of the upcoming Understanding Class series, so double thanks to Comrade Jordan. Speaking of editing, this very episode and the previous episode of the Brumaire series was actually edited by Jack from the Auxiliary Statements podcast. So thanks, comrade Jack. Make sure to check out their podcast, Auxiliary Statements, for loads of commie and cybernetic goodness. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes and live streams and want to help keep the lights on and the episodes flowing, head on over to Patreon throw me a few commie dollar. You also get access to the Emancipation Network Discord server, where there is constant, lively theoretical debate and shitposting galore to be had. Okay, let's get this chapter 6 out of here. Now picture to yourself the French bourgeois. Yes. How in the throes (laughs) of business panic his trade-crazy brain is tortured. Set in a whirl, stunned by rumors of coup d'etat, and the restoration of universal suffrage, by the struggle between Parliament and the executive power, by the fronde war between the Orleanists and the Legitimists, by the communist conspiracies in the south of France, by the alleged jacqueries in the department of the Nieve and Char, by the advertisements of the different candidates for presidency, by the cheap jack solutions offered by journals, by the threat of the Republicans to uphold the Constitution and universal suffrage by force of arms, by the gospel preaching of immigrant heroes in the and the part of us who announced that the world would come to an end on the second Sunday in May 1852. Think of all this and you will comprehend why in this unspeakable, deafening chaos of fusion, revision, prorogation, constitution, conspiration, coalition, immigration, usurpation, and revolution, the bourgeois madly snorts at his parliamentary republic, rather an end with terror than a terror without end, which this feels very, very apt to everything we're talking about, except now we're all trade crazed. Yeah. Well, like to, to locate it in the text a little bit, um, there's a huge paragraph, which we're not going to read that goes through essentially a textiles crisis where there's a crisis of like, there's crop failures and rise and falls in uh, the price of cotton. There's a, like a, crop failure in silk that or it's below average yield. And then like in wool manufacturing, the price of wool goes up quicker than the actual like wool products made from the raw materials can countenance. And so there's a whole like economic crisis in textiles. It's also happening in England, although it's more of a manufacturing thing in France and a bit more like commercially located in in England. But all the while, the bourgeoisie is blaming the political situation in the parliament for the the crisis. And it doesn't matter that right when the political crisis gets the worst, the economy recovers. <laughs> like, that's not, that's not, like, factoring into the analysis at all. Yeah, you like, know- Marx makes a case that is, like, it's, yeah, the politics was blamed on the economics, you know, which wasn't true. And but even you know even when the economics came back up, there was also still this political crisis, and the political crisis was deeper than just a normal standard trade crisis. It was you know it was a class battle that had to be, you know, the, the capitalism was birthing in France. That's well, the what... economics was blamed on the politics, right? Correct. Yeah, There's... but underlying it was a deeper political social battle that was going on that was kind of separate 
from the actual economic crisis that was being blamed, the politics was being blamed for? Well, I think I think actually the blame went both ways. Like the 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 politics was blamed on the economic crisis, and the economic crisis was blamed on the political crisis, which we both see now. I also think when people think that Marx is a one-to-one political determinist or economic determinist, when you reach it like this, you have to just go like, no, he's got a way more complicated picture of their interaction. Like they're they're feeding each other in these complicated feedback loops, but they're not one-to-one the same thing. Right. You have the commercial panic in England, but you didn't get this meltdown. Right. And the, but the meltdown does have to do with the larger structure of the economy in the sense that classes are driving the meltdown but not necessarily the immediate income, you know, income th- ratios, which, which always to me, like, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest to me, like people who read, and I know there's reasons to read capital this way, but people who read Marxism, Marxist as an immediate immiserationist and then read this, how do you justify that? Like, cause that, like, that's, this is this, you can't read this and go like, Oh, Marx thinks that politics is solely driven by immiseration in the political economy in a way that would lead to -to one-to-one revolution like because he's obviously seeing that's not true in france so how do you how do you process that to me that's a real question like because i don't i actually don't know what marx actually is on that term like i've read a lot of marx i i guess based on like what we're reading here and kind of like based on what you were talking about just now the thing that comes to mind is that maybe dare i say maybe use an analytic model like at least in this particular instance, it seems like there's a mediating factor between the economic situation and the political situation, the economic crisis and the political crisis, which would be the class struggle, right? The the kind of like ber- growing pains of like the the capitalist class displacing the landed aristocracy. Meanwhile, they're building up the proletariat, which is the new lower class, kind of creating this tension with it within both the economic sphere and the political sphere. That's why it's not one to one. Is that the way that the class conflict is impacting the politics and impacting the economics is different, and it's also different within nations. So I want to I, I want to just complicate this a little bit though. What Marx is describing here is is class struggle within the class itself. So it's not it, this is not like the proletariat versus the bourgeois. Yeah, this fair. is the bourgeois versus the bourgeois versus the ancien regime. Well, you know the the, yeah, the landed aristocracy <laughs> is becoming is is like it's morphing into a form of bourgeois but it's still right. kind of holding on to a lot of that old yeah. way what and another me- complicating factor is that like early in the chapter marx talks about how like if the party of order with the legitimists and the orleanists want to like be able to govern together mm-hmm. they already have the best form to do that in a parliament right. you can't do that with a familial monarchy it's just not going to work so they have to let go of that political form. If they want to survive, they have to let go of that political form and stick with their parliament and hash it out in parliament instead of trying to have a monarchy because you can, you got to pick a family. You can't have both. <laughs> yeah, in, 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 a, in a way, like, if, if they stuck with the bourgeois form, right. it would have been the best for the mutually competing factions of the, the monarchists. Right, like, because the state is a classed organ. Yeah. If you really, the, the lesson here is if you really love a monarch, you just got to let them go. <laughs> oh, I, guess, I guess it worked for Canada. Um, <laughs> it did. It really did. Yeah. Uh, Kyle? <laughs> that, that, that's Kyle speaking from lived experience. Like, what are you talking about? Like, when Harry and Angela. <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's. What, what do you mean? We still have a water. What are you talking no. about? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually being a dick. No, you know I, that I, I'm actually re- I'm actually a direct descendant of the High Kings of Ireland. I'm actually the royalty here. Holy the, shit! The last king. I'm not a direct. Fake. Everybody's got the name O'Brien, means son of Brian, which originates apparently from Brian Baru, who was the last king of Ireland, who was killed okay. after the Battle of Clontarf when they bet the shit out of the Vikings. Apparently, they said he was on his knees in his tent praying afterwards. But apparently, the proper history is that he was shagging the whole load of like uh, women of ill repute, and some like some fella came in and slit slit his throat. So um, there you go. Only one royalty here, motherfucker. That's better. That's what better than way, praying, honestly. What a way to go out. We go on to the next bit. Yeah, let's go on. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, let's go to the next bit. I mean, yeah, I, I I'm stunned to silence. Like, yeah, that's <laughs> the only thing that's going to get us to shut up. Like, really? Was there a line of thought? <laughs> no, I, no, I, I actually, good, good. I was what? actually thinking about, though, in all seriousness, in the, in this weird way in which America like loves British royalty in a way that's really yeah. profoundly unhealthy because we got rid of them. Yeah, um, and, yeah. Our it's... entire national identity is about how cool and strong we are that we fought the slavish, slaving tyranny of the British, even though I guess we kind of really love slaving tyranny. It's like going back to an abusive parent anyway. Yeah. Yeah. After okay. being you know, abusive parents. I'm going to read this bit. Okay. This is, there's basically a bit of, a bit of talk here beforehand where Marx talks about all the rumors of coups and how they started like the minute uh, Bonaparte got elected. And we end up here with this bit. The coup d'etat was ever the fixed idea of Bonaparte. With this idea, he again set foot on French soil. He was so obsessed by it that he continually betrayed it and blurted it out. He was so weak that just as continually he gave it up again. The shadow of the coup d'etat had become so familiar to the Parisians as a spectre that they were not willing to believe in it when it finally appeared in the flesh. What allowed the coup d'etat to succeed was therefore neither the reticent reserve of the chief of the society of December 10th, nor the fact that the National Assembly was caught unawares. If it succeeded, it succeeded despite its indiscretion and with its foreknowledge a necessary inevitable result of antecedent de developments. On October the 10th, Bonaparte announced to his ministers his decision to restore universal suffrage. On the 16th, they handed in their resignations. On the 26th, Paris learned of the formation of the Foreigny Ministry. Police prefect Carlier was simultaneously replaced by Maupin. The head of the first military division, Magnan, concentrated the most reliable regiments in the capital. On November 4th, the National Assembly resumed its sessions. It had nothing better to do than to recapitulate in a short, succinct form the course it had gone through and to prove that it was buried only after it had died. The first post it forfeited in the struggle with the executive power was the ministry. It had solemnly to admit this loss by accepting at full value the Thorigny ministry, a mere shadow cabinet. The permanent commission had received Monsieur Giraud with laughter when he presented himself in the name of the new ministers. Such a weak ministry for such strong measures as the restoration of universal suffrage. Yet the precise object was to get nothing through in Parliament, but everything against Parliament. Like, it's very difficult for me reading this stuff not to think of, of what went on with Brexit about how they played like these repeated votes in parliament and they basically got parliament to vote down, vote down against it, vote down against it, vote down against it and turned basically the electorate against parliament and wanted somebody just to come in and rescue the situation. Fuck it, doesn't matter what it is. You just, just do it, just do it. That's been an American political strategy for like... 50 years. Yeah, a long time. Yeah, the whole yeah. idea of like we, fucking Congress, you fucking assholes don't do shit. Like just a blind rage at the legislative body. Yeah, like, you know, oh, there's all this procedure and it's always stopped up. We just, we need solutions. We don't want any of the solutions on offer, of course, and we will <laughs> spend, uh, you know, pe people will spend lots of money to obstruct anything if anything tries to get done. But, you know, goddamn Congress, if only, and there is, there is definitely the kind of Gosh, if only we had, you know, a strong man that can push things through. Yeah, and, it, yeah. the 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 sort of like you know every so often the New York Times editorial board just gets a huge uh, enthusiasm for uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, um, the yeah. Bloomberg liberal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, but like that's that that's actually like that's that's U.S. politics on both sides is like we hate we hate. Congress. Congress is designed not to function. Actually, as a side note, it is designed not to function, particularly after reforms in the the conservative and progressive reforms in the middle 20th century actually really made Congress a lot less functional. So you always like you have more democracy because democracy is going to lead to dysfunction. And then we're going to have we're going to have everyone focus on a national election and then we can just force stuff through through the executive. And it works. This has been kind of a, a bourgeois apparatus thing for a long time. Yeah. Esri, do you want to take the next bit? Sure. 
On the very first day of its reopening, the National Assembly received the message from Bonaparte in which he demanded the restoration of universal suffrage and the abolition of the law of May 31st, 1850. The same day his ministers introduced a decree to this effect. The National Assembly at once rejected the ministry's motion of urgency and rejected the law itself on November 13th by 355 votes to 348. Thus, it tore up its mandate once more. It once more confirmed the fact that it had transformed itself from the freely elected representatives of the people to the usurpatory parliament of a class. It acknowledged once more that it had itself cut in two the muscles which connected the parliamentary head with the body of the nation. By its motion to restore universal suffrage, the executive power appealed from the National Assembly to the people the legislative power appealed by its Quaestor's Bill from the people to the army. This Quaestor's Bill was to establish its right of directly requisitioning troops of forming a parliamentary army. While it thus designated the army as the arbiter between itself and the people, between itself and Bonaparte, while it recognized the army as the decisive state power, it had to confirm, on the other hand, the fact that it had long given up its claim to dominate this power. By debating its right to requisition troops, instead of requisitioning them at once, it betrayed its doubts about its own powers. By rejecting the Quaestor's Bill, it made public confession of its impotence. The bill was defeated, its proponents lacking 108 votes of a majority. The Montaigne thus decided the issue. It found itself in the position of Burden's ass, not indeed between two bundles of hay with the problem of deciding which was the more attractive but between two showers of blows with the problem of deciding which was the harder. On the one hand, there was the fear of Jean Garnier. On the other, the fear of Bonaparte. It must be confessed that the position was not a heroic one. On November 18th, an amendment was moved to the law on municipal elections introduced by the party of order to the effect that instead of three years, one year's domicile should suffice for municipal electors. The amendment was lost by a single vote, but this vote immediately proved to be a mistake. By splitting up into its hostile factions, the party of order had long ago forfeited its independent parliamentary majority. It showed now that there was no longer any majority at all in parliament. The National Assembly had become incapable of transacting business. Its atomic constituents were no longer held together by any force of cohesion. It had drawn its last breath. It was dead. And see. <laughs> Uh, I should play some organ music here. Yeah, this would be good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> R.I.P. Um, uh. <laughs> R.I.P. P.O.O. That's what I say. Yeah, they were doomed. Really, the initials of Party of Order is poo. Really, like <laughs> they were never going to do anything. Is it that way in French? Hmm. <laughs> Le poo. All right. No, it we're would done. be party would be at the end, wouldn't it be? It would be like oops. <laughs> <laughs> what's up? Uh, that's, that's why I was way more confident. <laughs> Whichever way you look you, at, you, you can't have you can't have party at the front uh, in uh, in French. Uh, like yeah, in in, right. in Canada, we have the uh, Pelti Québécois, the uh, the Québécois party in in Quebec, as you might imagine. So 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 it would have been poo. It would have been poo. Yeah, because it was the <laughs> it was the French Communist Party, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like right. uh Pelty Doldre or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And so that's so this is pathetic, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> they voted on the bill to try to do something that I guess they already had the power to do. It wasn't clear if that was something they could just do, or or if what Marx meant is that since Bonaparte is playing dirty and extra constitutionally, like. Just fucking get the troops to defend yourself. Fuck it. Like this point, like I don't even think he was acting extra constitutionally when he did any of these moves. He was able to get rid of the ministers. The thing is that they they had already assigned over the power. Do you remember there was a part where Shangarnier was supposed to be uh, reporting to them or something, and he basically filled the army with loyalists, and they wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, so that they'd already kind of lost control over the army, particularly when they went against the army over they them going in uh, attacking rome the roman republic 
Mm-hmm. So they've That's already right. lost the army. So it, this vote was them trying to regain the army on some got level, it, got it. but they but they couldn't even really do it. Like uh, because- that's, that's, that's not quite right, Tom. The, the vote was to oh. raise a separate army under the control of Parliament, which would not be under the control of Shangong Ye. This this was uh, this was brought up a little bit, or was brought up a little bit earlier in the text. This this question of of the parliamentary army, but yeah, they 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 basically didn't have the confidence. They didn't have the guts to try to raise a separate army to take on Sean Garnier's army. But okay, this, so they, they they already lost control of the army. Then they're like, hey, let's make our own army, and then yeah. they couldn't. They're like, let's vote about raising like a parliamentary, like you know, extra, you know, I don't know, like what, what's the word? Extra military? I forget the word. Militia, you know, Par- paramilitary. Like, like, yeah, let's get let's have an official paramilitary and let's well, vote like- on having a paramilitary. Basically. Well, the funny thing is, they did, and it was called the uh, National Guard. Right, yeah. <laughs> it was right. gone. So, right, uh. right. But in in Kyle, yeah. were, in this, were they not trying to requisition, like, take a part of the army and make it make it answerable to the to the parliament, or this was going to be? Uh, I, I, I think division? they were trying to raise an entirely separate force. Yeah, yeah, that was a yeah. dumb idea. Dumb idea. It, well, yeah, it was an act of desperation, right? Like yeah. they had this idea on the books as like a kind of insurance policy for their power right and then when the moment came to actually call it in they realized how unfeasible it was and didn't amount to anything so it's fucking pathetic anyway you slice it so this is sort of how like trump uses dhs to do the work that he can't get the army to do and dhs mm-hmm. is like not actually all that yeah other than border patrol being a bunch of paramilitary goons that we've allowed to be paramilitary goons for 50 years it can't really do that much because like they don't actually have that much power even under broad authorization of powers going back to bush is that what it's like because it's it's like this is where the analogy to the current really falls down because for one thing yeah, the american politicals have not really paid attention to the army and politicized it since i don't know eisenhower uh, during like Vietnam, there was some politicization. Yeah, but like, but even then, like you had it like like Ma- Vietnam War. McNamara like did the Pentagon Papers to mess with LBJ. Like so, they didn't even really control it that that thoroughly. Then I think you might see this as uh, similar to what happened in the the English Civil War. Okay, par- Parliament had its own army, right? But of course, this is a more modern situation where you have standing armies and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I I think, you know, if you look at like, yeah, I guess there's there's it's it's definitely like the situation with DHS is kind of like in between this idea and like the society of what was it? The society of December 10th, December 10th. Right. That's that's kind of what DHS feels like to me is like. Yeah. yeah, it's like it's kind of part of the state. It's kind of a conspiracy. It's kind of a personalistic power thing. But, but I don't think that's, that's, that's where DHS came up before. Like that's that's what I was thinking about. Is that when we talked about DHS before, it was actually on the Bonapartist side. And yeah, here this. Yeah, is... it's 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 definitely not like Congress is running DHS against the <laughs> Pentagon or something like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that'd be madness, man. The, yeah. When I think about that, it is like Congress called up an additional militia so so because it didn't trust the Pentagon staffing the generals correctly because it liked the president too much. Like that is mm. the American and we don't that didn't even happen in the Civil War. So like we don't have anything like like this is truly sad and pathetic. Please help us, military. We can't raise in time. <laughs> I mean, like, what would they have done if they got it? Even like, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have done anything. They, they, they would have. Vo- they would have voted on whether to have a coup. Like that's what they would have done. It's like full parliamentary cretinism. Yeah, and, and of course, the people doing this are royalists. <laughs> <laughs> That's the funny thing. It's so fucking yeah. backwards. Yeah, like a hundred, like yeah, a hundred years after, like their idol was decapitated to prevent this kind of like governmental form from taking hold. It's like, help me, you know, Parliament. You're my only hope. 
it's 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 really a, a pathetic farce. Like like and Mark's really in, you can tell Mark's really enjoys how humiliated they are <laughs> while being terrified and kind of like like at the same time like you know this is actually kind of scary but it's kind of funny too. I mean it, Mark, it is it, a bit of an S same. It is interesting to me. This is the text that, if you want to understand where Marxists fail, to, like Marxists fail to understand fascism, is because they didn't, they don't see this text enough. Because fascists always tend to start off this kind of farcical and then end up like killing yeah. a whole shit ton of people. Yeah, like... people. People think, oh, they're just idiots. Look, they don't, they don't make any sense. They're stupid. And the next thing they know, they've got their hands on the fucking weapons. And it doesn't matter if they're, if they have stupid ideology. You know? They they don't win ultimately, but they can kill a whole lot of people and failing, and that's like yeah, yeah. right. That's bad yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah, but like and in fairness to Bonaparte, he didn't really fail, and he didn't really did he kill that many people in in the grand scheme of things. No, I think, prob- he, I think he just he just lost France a catastrophic war with Germany or Prussia at the time. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Other than, yeah. other than that, other than that, yeah. Oh shit! There's my. <laughs> see, you can listen to all those fucking revolutions podcasts, but they go in one ear and out the other. That's, fucking... that's that's why we got the chopping block, Tom. You're gonna make me and you sound as smart as possible. No one will be any the wiser. Hell yeah, a lot of chopping to do today. Who are poo and oops? Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, Kyle, do you want to round it out? I'm just all right, sounds speech. good. All right, so we start with a, a blog quote from the Journal des Débats. This, this quote is actually a quote of Bonaparte that he's given to people on the return from the London Industrial Exhibition to a whole load of a yes. crowd of bourgeoisie. Right, so he says, uh, with such unhoped for successes, I am justified in reiterating how great the French Republic would be if it were permitted to pursue its real interests and reform its institutions, instead of constantly disturbed by demagogues on the one hand and by monarchist hallucinations on the other, loud, stormy, and repeated applause from every part of the amphitheater. The monarchist hallucinations hinder all progress and all important branches of industry. In place of progress, nothing but struggle. One sees men who were formerly the most zealous supporters of the royal authority and prerogative become partisans of a convention merely in order to weaken the authority that has sprung from universal suffrage. Loud and repeated applause. We see men who have suffered most from the revolution and have deplored it most provoke a new one and merely in order to fetter the nation's will. I promise you tranquility for the future, et cetera, et cetera. Bravo, bravo, a storm of bravos. This is Bonaparte with his his, his adoring yeah. audience. Um, so this is how democracy dies. <laughs> <laughs> so what's funny about this is we always try to make Bonaparte like Trump is a Bonapartist, but like in some ways that I feel like that could come out of Joe Biden's mouth like verbatim. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Kyle called sure. that early. 18th, 18th Brevere of Joe Biden. 18th Brevere of Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway. God. We thought it was funny at the time. We thought it was funny. <laughs> until, until history is on horseback. Oh, yeah, God. You're right. History. History on horseback. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, so... Thus, the industrial bourgeoisie applauds with servile bravos the coup d'etat of December 2nd, the annihilation of parliament, the downfall of its own rule, the dictatorship of Bonaparte. The thunder of applause on November 25th had its answer in the thunder of cannon on December 4th, and it was on the house of Monsieur Salandros who had clapped most that they clapped most of the bombs. <laughs> Cromwell, when he dissolved the Long Parliament, went alone into its midst, took out his watch so that it should not continue to exist a minute after the time limit he had fixed, and drove each one of the members of Parliament with hilariously humorous taunts. Napoleon, smaller than his prototype, at least he betook himself on the 18th Brumaire to the legislative body, 
and read out to it, though in a faltering voice, its sentence of death. The second Bonaparte, who, moreover, found himself in possession of an executive power very different from that of Cromwell or Napoleon, sought his model not in the annals of world history, but in the annals of the Society of December the 10th, in the annals of the criminal courts. He robs the Bank of France of 25 million francs, buys General Mag Magnon with a million, the soldiers with 15 francs apiece and liquor, comes together with his accomplices secretly like a thief in the night, has the houses of the most dangerous parliamentary leaders broken into, and Cavagnac, La Mauriciel, Le Flo, Changarnier, Charat, Trier, Buzz, etc., dragged from their beds and put in prison. The chief squares of Paris and the parliamentary building occupied by troops and cheap jack placards posted early in the morning on all the walls proclaiming the dissolution of the National Assembly and the Council of State, the restoration of universal suffrage, and the placing of the same department in a state of siege. In like manner, he inserted a little later in the Monitel a false document which asserted that influential parliamentarians had grouped themselves around him and formed a state consulta. The Rump Parliament assembled in the Mali building of the uh, 10th arrondissement and consisting mainly of the Legitimists and Orleanists votes the deposition of Bonaparte amid repeated cries of long live the Republic unfailingly harangues the gaping crowds before the building and is finally led off in the custody of African sharpshooters first to the Dulce barracks and later packed into prison vans and transported to the prisons of Maza and Vincennes. Thus ended the party of order, the legislative assembly, and the February Revolution. Wow. Whenever wow. I feel bad about American history, I can always look to France. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then there's a, there's, a, there's a nice handy timeline of mm. its Requiem for a Dream style degeneration <laughs> that we probably all could have consulted beforehand. Just to, uh, <laughs> just because, because we don't remember all of all of our Mike Duncan offhand. So, yeah, yeah, he's got a he's got a very uh, excellent outline of uh, the stages of degeneration. I love how in the the first period from February twenty fourth to May fourth, eighteen forty eight, February period prologue. Universal Brotherhood Swindle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, but you know, it's it's so I forget that Marx is funny. Yeah, and then uh, the last the last bit here, <laughs> victory of Bonaparte, parody of restoration of empire. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you spend a lot of time with like totally humorless Marxists, you, you do forget that Marx had a sense of humor. Is a funny person. Is entertaining to read. Also, if you spend all your time looking at his uh, unedited like political economy notes or posthumous stuff, it's like. But let's say the Grandessa is not funny. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Theories of surplus value is not very. You know, I mean, I guess there's there's a, there's a couple dunks. There's some there. there's some zingers in some zingers Capital in Volume One and Two, but in general, you got about 500 pages between them, and most of them are in footnotes. So, right, yeah. like, <laughs> there's, some, there's some good stuff in Volume Three when he gets to talking about like the finance sector. Oh God, that is mm. funny. Yeah. I actually wish Marx had lived long enough to write more about the finance sector because it's become so important. But also it's like when he says some hilarious shit in that part of the book. Anybody uh, know who this uh, Monsieur Salandrews was who clapped the most uh, <laughs> that they clapped most of the bombs? On him? <laughs> like I looked him up. I think he was like uh, some bourgeoisie. So I wonder why they fucked the bombs on him. Just kind of an aside. He uh, uh, appears to be an industrialist of some sort. Yeah, I I do want to just sort of mention in this in this history, the greatest booster of the Nazis in Austria. As soon as the Nazis showed up, they're like, "Oh, you're too much of an academic for us," 
<laughs> killed him the first day of the wow. Anschluss. What? Who, who are you saying? Uh, he was a he was a he was an intellectual who turned towards supporting and boosting Nazism and uh, Führer Prinzip <laughs> and okay. argued for Anschluss. And as soon as the SS rolled into Austria, they did him in <laughs> just, just right away. It was like, nah, I don't think you're going to fit in here, buddy. Rip. Thunder of bombs fell upon his head. The bombs clapped on who, who had clapped most. All right. Makes okay. sense. It's Is the custody of African sharpshooters the uh, his part of the uh, lumpen composition of the Society of December 10th? They're a, they're a division. They're the army. They'd be a section of the... They're probably like Algerian troops or something. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. There's nothing much to say about this, but it's just basically like this is the end of it. Do we have anything else we wanted to say about Chapter 6 before we close up? Party Thor is a bunch of cucks. I, 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 okay, baby. (laughs) (laughs) They're rhinos. (laughs) <laughs> they, were liter- they literally were rhinos, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, they were monarchists <laughs> who were masquerading as Republicans. And you should yeah, not cry yeah. for the monarchy as long live the Republic. Like, oh. Uh, yeah. oh, that's hard. Long live the Republic as the Republic puts them into prison vans. Kyle, oh, that's two classics you have. The, 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 the 18th premier of Joe Biden and rhinos. <laughs> Republicans in name only. It's funny like, because I wasn't sure if you there. met I wasn't sure if you met Republicans or Royalists in name only, because they could be both. Oh my like, god. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. I mean like I said, sometimes French history makes me feel better about American history. So why do you say that? Well, um, <laughs> why do you say that? <laughs> because of this. Like our early bourgeoisie were still in the English yeoman tradition, and they were fools, but they were fools who, who were more competent, frankly. <laughs> they still had slavery and com- big time and committed genocide. So it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, but, yeah but that's yeah, all yeah. the bourgeoisie. This that's is, everybody. This, like, this isn't a virtue contest. This is no, like, no, 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 no. A, I know, this, the, this is the least, least, least ridiculous contest. Yeah, yeah least like, bad. This is not, know. this is not who's better. I mean, like, W- would I rather be a, a a a slave in Haiti or a slave in the U.S. South? Like that's a that's an idiotic question. You don't want to be either. But like, right. our degeneration in 1860 was an actual proper fucking tragedy that also led to liberation. There's leads to not much of anything at all. So mm-hmm. it leads to you know Saint Simonianism and massive state finance investment. And uh, a lot of scandals and harebrained schemes, uh, which terminate when uh, the the Prussians roll in. Right. Which right. which also hear- tends to be like now that's the province of America and Britain. So you know. Did you hear? Did you hear <laughs> Boris Johnson's latest one? Actually, it's a few months old. Uh, talk about harebrained schemes. He wants to build a bridge from the UK to Ireland, like which would be probably like forty miles. And it goes over all the all the ordnance where where they dumped all their bombs uh, after World War Two. So it's like if you sail like in the Irish Sea, like there's these like certain pits where you you're 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 told not to go near because like literally they dropped like I think a couple of million tons of explosives to the bottom of the sea out there after World War Two. So he wants to build a bridge over that, and the experts are going like, we can't go near there for like. 10,000 years or something. <laughs> Tom, no big up. deal. Just dig them up and shoot them into the sun. Yeah. No problem. I know. It's just, yeah. Well, also, also, I like to just remind people who get a little bit like, oh, Europe is so wonderful. And I'm like, Mm-mm. like, do you, do you read European news, particularly from the X part of Europe that is now the dangly bits um, floating in the <laughs> ocean? The dangly uh, bits <laughs> floating in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This, is not, this is not Star Trek. This isn't the Klingon Empire we're talking about here. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I've always thought oh, yeah. that Europe was a dangly bits off Asia, and now I'm just going to like, well, it has its own dangly bits up yeah. up north, like just floating. We're at worst wow. with the hind quarters. 
Hindquarters. <laughs> You're the hindquarter. Uh, yeah. The rump. The rump. Yeah, dang, dangly fractals. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, mean, like, I, I just, I don't know. Like, we keep making these comparisons. And, you know, the one thing I'll say about, you know, American yeoman bourgeoisie, like, making pacts with slavers and bullshit is that, like, you know, they set they set up Articles of Confederation, didn't work. Then they, you know, hammer through a constitution. The Republic survives a civil war and is, like, still around. What will this country do? Because all things end when things come tumbling down. In France, I mean, the government falls all the time. Like, I was about to say, French like, we're, like, the third it. empire, the fourth republic. Yeah, fourth whatever. Republic. Like, whatever. They'll just, <laughs> they'll just get a new one. They can just put it back. <laughs> They've done it before. They'll do it again. You know, like... It's fine. But what happens when there's a real 18th Brumaire in the United States, right. when there's really like a, when the, the grand experiment actually, like the actual institutions crumble. Like and We always compare it to the Soviet Union, but the Soviet experiment was only like two generations <laughs> long. Yeah, right. that was like it's one a, guy, like like who you know drank a lot of carrot juice. And it's lived one a of those. Time. Yeah, it's one of those things I actually like to point out when people are always like, "Well, America is the youngest national culture," or, you know, and I'm like, "It's an artificial nation, but it's literally the oldest constitutional nation on earth." Yeah, there's loads of European nations are fucking only about twenty years old. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, like, like what happens when this state falls? It, that, you don't just put Humpty Dumpty back together again. No, there's no second American Republic. Like, well, I mean, it, it, there might be, maybe. but it'll be in like New Jersey. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say? Long live the Jersey Republic. <laughs> the, the what are you, what are you trying to say? It'll, it'll, it'll be unlivable. Like, what, 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 what are you saying? No, I mean, like. I'm just saying, like, who's gonna want it? And I think, I think it's gonna be the 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 state of Springsteen would want to be the second American Republic, and like, oh like there's God. a balkanization, there's a balkanization <laughs> process, and some of them might have some, like, hey, remember when we had a continent-wide block from sea to shining sea, Kitch, basically, yeah. like, because, like, it, it, yeah, we, it does seem like, I, I don't know, people have said this in the past, certainly the new left said stuff like this does seem like we're reaching the ends of our ability to resolve problems constitutionally. Right. Um, well, well, the, well, here's, here's what happens. What if the constitution fails, but the state doesn't, which is, I think actually more likely. Yeah. That's kind of been the, that's kind of been the situation for a while. Like you get that like overtly. late Roman empire vibe. Right. Exactly. And I like to yeah. like, po point when people are like, well, you're going to be at civil war real soon. I'm like, dude, the Roman empire fell for like, I don't know, a thousand fucking years. <laughs> Oh, like, you're counting Byzantium, like, and, and, you know, and rightly so. So, so like, we're gonna, so we're gonna split down the middle. Like, the western half is gonna go like pretty quick and fall to the Californian barbarians, and then the eastern half is gonna preserve its like. Well, I, I guess that what what the dynamic would be flipped. I, right? I, I would actually like the, the eastern the eastern half would would fall, and the western half would be like Americana, like preservationists for a thousand years, yeah, right? What's, what, what's, what's weird American about, yeah. Byzantium. What's weird about that, though, is I would say that, that California is the only part of the United States that could actually survive, but I don't actually believe that anymore because of both water and fire problems. It is actually not a viable republic. It has too many natural resource issues. So mm -hmm. it's like, what do you do? I it mean, would have to be like, it'd have to be like Israel, just you know, ultra organized. Oh, that's like, like it would it would have to be a very disciplined society to survive because you're talking about like yearly fire wars and water rationing ad infinitum. Yeah. So so like yeah. the culture of the Bay in L.A. would just have to not exist. They'd it's, have to yeah. annihilate themselves in like a kombucha war or something. Well, like, I mean, like California fash. I guess those are a thing, though. So we're talking about the new Californian <laughs> Republic from Fallout New Vegas. Is that what we're talking yeah, about? Basically. Like it. It's not like worse, but worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the new yeah. Californian Republic is at least nominally democratic. Uh, no, but yeah, but they're really like, I mean, they look good compared to the Legion, you know, that are exactly. LARPing ancient Rome and talking about Hegelian dialectics <laughs> in, in a good way, which we all know is a big red it's flag, a big red flag. huge red flag, and, you know, are literally instituting slavery. But the New California Republic are also a bunch of jackbooted thugs. Yeah, of course. Like, 
So. Basically, what we're saying is that the only good route is free, uh, independent New Vegas. I mean, they do use an, an August Blanqui quote for that, <laughs> like for that for that quest. So that's pretty good. Anyway, um, the what, point what is, are we, what are we talking about? What, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking <laughs> about, Jesse? Yeah, uh, I, I was more. I was more just. War I actually am thinking that we're seeing that the United States has a hyper brittle constitution. I think we all kind of know it now. Yeah, yeah, but I think. It's more it's than just a constitution. A I think I think their empire at the moment is brittle and it's breaking down. And I think that will that will be the thing. I think that will be it will catalyze the all of this stuff, like the social and the political. But it's really like the endogenous factors that seem to be weakening more so than the imperial holdings. And like, in order to like actually keep the internal structure together, that would be the reason to like withdraw, kind of like in the United Kingdom. Yeah, I was like, about to say, like, our military is still holding on to its proxies pretty well. Like, it's right. that's not the problem. And and it's also able to keep our dollar afloat, which is right. also not the problem. The problem is, in ter it is a lot like, it is more like, like, in some way, where ancient Rome, where our own internal politics is actually what's mm -hmm. making our imperial project fail, not, not even over-expansion. I don't know, like, how much... It was internal politics in Rome that caused the thing. I think it was a lot more complex than that. But also, I would say that that if you look at the transactions, the percentage uh, of of purchases done by China and Russia in uh, the U.S. dollar has dropped really significantly over the last few years. Yeah, but they, they've like, been threatening it for a long time. Oh yeah, it? but but it dropped it from about ninety percent of all transactions, uh, foreign transactions in the dollar, about four years ago to about sixty percent this year so i but, think that's that's a that's a that's a but function the, of the dollar but, but is you're a proper marxist tom and i often doubt that you are hey hey lowercase m people because he's descriptive um because because you flirt too much with currency shit oh god almighty yeah, i know you're going to go there Sassy again Derek. no no no, no. Okay, but actually, Derek. Actually, Derek. Actually, actually here's my here's my point the transformation right. problem makes MMT true. Anyway, what? That is true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Derek. Go for it. Derek, You're Derek. gonna make your friend mad. Really mad. Anyway, uh, make a point. <laughs> the the bigger point is China China's economy is dependent on using America to, to dip to throw us over production. Like that that mm. is a major factor in how it can produce um even with you know the state the state it effectively overproduces even for a capitalist economy and even if you don't think it's a capitalist commodity it's really overproducing and it has that problem and it has a problem with with, with india so the, the you actually the the reason why i keep on saying rome is rome is where you don't have a clear hegemony to like just replace the old one we really don't like you yeah. don't have a clear like it's actually not clear that china can actually do it under its current structure and the UNESCO and, the, and what I'm not, and I'm not saying that means the U.S. will. It means that like there's vestigial problems everywhere. Like there's yeah. not a clear new. I I, think I, it's, it's crisis. You're going to have a long period of crisis and stagnation and crisis. That's that's what I look at. Well, and, I mean, I think that's a I think that's a given. But I also think like if you look at it in terms of. It depends on when we look at crisis. Do we look at it in terms of capitalist crisis, or or in terms of other of like social collapse, and what I keep on telling Marxists is like the end of feudalism is, I mean, the end of feudalism in the beginning of capitalism is actually kind of world historically the odd man out. That's not what normally happens when you hit crisis like this. You normally do have slow endogenous collapse. If we're using Rome as, as the example, like that led to the rise of feudalism because they couldn't, people couldn't rely on the Roman empire to keep them safe. So they looked towards their like local aristocratic landowners. So it, are you saying that like the kind of like accelerationist neo reaction people might be kind of right as as you know we see the slow decline of like the American Empire with no clear hegemon to like replace it? Is it just going to be like we're looking to our local <laughs> nation state uh, warlords to protect? Us? Well, yeah, like the corporate like patchwork CEOs or whatever. Yeah, you're going to be looking at different things depending on different areas. I also think you'll mm. see a lot stronger regional politics. I mean, in some ways, like the, I hate to say the Duganists, but the Duganists hope about breaking up American hegemony is not this so they can replace it as a world empire, but so right. that like you have these strong regionally dominant, fairly conservative, reactionary like regimes emerge to dominate local areas in a way that like the liberal order as headed by America has prevented. 
and you'll see that in in the in the in liberal order itself. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're seeing is you're seeing various attempts to deal with the fact that everybody thinks there's a crisis coming that's bigger than the one we currently have. You know, there's the big one, which is which is ecological, which no one can do shit about. But there's there's all these other things that we're hitting the limits on. Where, where I'm at is I don't think it's going to look like I, I actually don't think it looks like a civil war. I don't think it looks like a revolution. Even I think it looks like like without certain other factors happening, it looks like a long kind of slow decline it's like we won't know it until it's a way over. And then I think it probably like in the United States probably started in the before the Soviet Union even fell. But mm. I, I could see I could see easily a kind of a 19. I mean, like some kind of a 19 uh, 1830 type revolution, as in it's a revolution that tries in 20 years time or something and is kind of, you know, brought down a different path than it's intended. I oh, yeah, yeah, I could see something that, like that happening. But what yeah. I don't see is like, uh, like, like I'm, a, I, I'm, a, I talk to a lot of people who really believe in like Grossman and Mandel and like this, this final immiseration thesis, and they really want to believe it. They really, really want to believe that you raise the, pro, the the proletariat up through capital and the socialization, then watch it clash, and it automatically will lead to a communist revolution. I, I, I just if that's, I, I'm gonna say if that's what Marx believed, he's wrong, and I don't Marx, know that that's what Marx believed either. Marx yeah. very clearly didn't believe that. Like, it, it, I, in my view, like in all of his like political like speeches and strategic writings and letters, uh, he, I mean, he really saw the opportunity for revolutions and wars, which is right. Like when he he was looking forward essentially to a continent wide war that could be turned into a civil war, which of course didn't really happen until the war lasted too long. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I, Mar Marxist point of views on this are not Marx's point of view on this. Right. Like, Marx, he's, like, Marx does seem to understand that the in that the wars do do have a tie to economic like business cycles and and crackdowns and and elites. But we do, like the the one to one like the immiseration of the proletariat will lead to the revolution because of the economic propelling it like. I, there's just no evidence for that. There, there isn't. We yeah. like if, if that was true, 1890 should have ended capitalism. Right. What was the private rate of profit in capital in 1890? It dropped dr precipitously. Yeah, like, it was still still way higher than what it is now. I think even at the drop, <laughs> the, you know, the, the the world rate of profit is probably something like 10 percent now. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, and, right. and it's going down. You know, it's, it's probably less now. That's the last it stats that I've seen are about 2015, you know. But, like, yeah. So I, I think what we're going to see is, like, as well, like, we're seeing a global low rate of profit uh, emerge in most, you know, most places. Yeah, even, even China. Profit. Even China. Yeah, China will even have... China. China's had a lot the of... The rate of GDP exploitation. Drop. You know, I, I imagine a multipolarity of stuff coming out. That's Me too. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's most likely. Because, you know... I think it would take 20 years to get a good uh, revolutionary party, say, in the US, say a really good one. You know, it'd probably take 20 years, right? And, you know, unless it starts now, you know, you're not going to see Yeah, it might be. You're not going to see some this cycle. It's too late, this yeah. cycle, probably. Just to one last, kind of go back to, like, how, you know, the end of the American empire or whatever, and, like, how, like, changes of mode of production generally happen. I think one of the differences and one of the things that was unique about the transition from feudalism to capitalism is kind of like taking on like a kind of cybernetic perspective. Like you had to add work into the system in order to make it become capitalism to centralize it in that way is something that came to mind. Like I think part of that was came through the economic changes, but also through the political clashes that came through the, the uh, revolutions and France and England and, and the Americas. Well, this is where, like, I'm not a total Brenner thesis person, but I think where Brenner has a point is England in particular had an incentive to reinvest into production after the enclosure movement in ways that that other states which tried to do um, imperial extraction early, such as, such as Spain, did not have mm -hmm. the incentive to do. That willingness to do reinvestment really does matter. 
that's that's the main difference. It's not like that that like feudal feudal empire late feudal empires were like dude like Spain controlled like had access to resources the likes of which we don't even really understand, and yet it couldn't generate a profit generating mechanism like it just couldn't yeah. like it, like it w- they they were like at they were at feudal profit modes like if you go look it's like something like one percent if you try to convert it into GDP and all those historical conversions are questionable but it's still like it's clearly super low. <laughs> Whereas early, like Engl- early English industrial capitalism had profit rates like the world had never seen, so like that's that's a huge as to why I mean you know that's that's an open question but um, and imper- you know and, and it makes imperialism a lot a lot more efficient right like it's it's possible but, but now like what can you even imperialize really like what can you what can you bring capitalism even to like I guess maybe like miniature tr- like tiny tiny barely hanging on tribes in the middle of the amazon that like, that's all you got left gonna yeah. send a mission to the sentinelese good luck yeah. with that <laughs> yeah um <laughs> i love that they killed that guy that's brilliant they just stabbed him with a spear fucking brilliant <laughs> gotta love them guys right yeah. <laughs> oh my god I, i've only really seen that there's a there's a, a film by uh Scorsese about the Jesuit monks going to Japan. Has anybody yeah, seen I've seen Silence. Yeah, it's quite. Re- I think that's a very reactionary film. I really like the guy who played the the total bastard Japanese kind of political guy who was torturing them. Was a fucking brilliant actor. But um, it kind of reminds me of that. I would recommend watching those. Quite a decent film. If you reactionaries make better movies generally. I hate to admit it, but well, those are the only ones who get to make movies. <laughs> Let's be honest. The well, no, movie. we have Brett. Who Brett? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, we've got one. Who's the English guy? Ken Loach. Ken, it's Loach, Ken yeah. Loach. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Um, I, want see, I want to see Boots Riley make another movie. Oh, Come that on. was quality. I like Boots. That was a fucking great. That, film. that was that was a good movie. That was a great movie. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.